faith. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming. My name's Andy Bodding. I'm a system engineer, and I work for ARDC, the Australian uh, Research Data Commons. And uh, we operate the Nectar Research Cloud. Um, I'll just give a little bit of background about um, the Nectar Research Cloud. So we're a uh, nationally funded project in Australia, and we provide a compute resource for Australian research. Um, we operate uh, across eight different sites around the country. Um, each of those sites uh, operates sort of semi-autonomously. Um, and we run a, I'm part of the core services team that operates the kind of central APIs. Um, we run uh, quite a large, quite a large installation with, I think, more than a thousand compute nodes, um, and I think we have something like sixteen thousand registered users, um, with about three and a half thousand active projects in a year or so. Um, so we do do quite a lot of work. Um, so what I want to do is just give a little bit of overview of how metadata works. Um, uh, so, uh, as most of you might know, when you, when you boot your virtual machine, the, uh, you, Nova will provide a mechanism for uh, obtaining metadata about that instance for setting up networking, understanding what the host name should be, uh, SSH keys, um, those sorts of things. Um, it can be served from a config drive or um, a special URL with the 169.254, uh, 169.254 address. Um, so a request to that will then be passed through to Nova, um, and Nova can um, uh, build, a, build some information to then um, allow the instance to uh, provision itself. Um, it, this is most useful when used with cloud init. So cloud init will understand uh, how to uh, fetch that metadata um, and perform actions on that. Uh, and, and so there's a couple of different types of uh, data that are available within Nova. Um, the first one is uh, the first one in my list here is uh, user data. So user data is the metadata that the user provides when they're booting the instance. So the user, uh, this is optional, of course. User doesn't have to provide any, but if they do, um, that user data will be made available and Cloud Init can discover that uh, and perform provisioning tasks based on that data. Um, you might provide scripts for uh, installing some software or installing some packages. Um, it's up to you, really. Uh, lots of possibilities there. Um, the second one here is, um, the, the sort of general metadata that we call, um, and, and that's provided by Nova and provides uh, uh, s system sort of data. So it's going to provide um, what the instance ID is, what the host name of the instance is, um, SSH keys, um, this, and other things as well. So things that um, the instance might need to know to do its proper provisioning. Um, and the last one I've got there, which is uh, really what this talk is about, is vendor data. And so vendor data is, is a third form of data which can be provided by the cloud operator. Um, there's two types of vendor data, um, two types, the dynamic and static. Um, the static vendor data is, is where you can provide a single JSON file and what will happen is that JSON file will just be served as is um, through to Cloud Init, and it will be available at that URL, uh, the, the sort of um, the, the standard U place where you would get your metadata. But it would end in vendordata.json. So that that will be the file. Uh, the file provided to Nova will then be provided through under that file name, uh, and Cloud Init understands that file and it will request that file when using the um, OpenStack data source. Uh, and so the, the information provided in that file will then be merged with the system metadata and the user metadata. And so you can have all of those, those three sources 
provide um, data through to your virtual machine for CloudNet to use. Um, so the main part of the talk here is to talk about the dynamic vendor data. So dynamic vendor data is uh, data that you can provide to a virtual machine and the dynamic, the dynamic data is, is generated based on context given to a web service. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about context in a minute. Um, so this vendor data can be available uh, from the vendor data, vendor underscore data to dot JSON file. Um, and, and so the, the interesting part about this though is cloud init does not look at this file, um, at least not yet. Uh, I had a look in the source code and it would be possible to extend cloud init, but it currently doesn't look for that file. So if you do go down this path and you want to provide dynamic vendor data to your instances or your users, um, you will need some way of handling that yourself. Um, so what I'd like to introduce now is a little project that I built called uh, Nova Pollinate. Uh, and so the purpose of this project is to facilitate the generation of that dynamic vendor data. So um, how it works is Nova, for the request to come through, Nova. Nova will then need a URL configured in its config file um, to then point to a uh, web service endpoint. Uh, and so what this project does is it facilitates that web service. Um, it is, uh, it's a very simple architecture. It's, it's a basic web service, but it's designed to be pluggable by nature. So you can build your own um, plugins, um, and what will happen is each of those plugins will be executed uh, based on the, the, the context passed from Nova will be, will be available to your plugin, and you can perform whatever sort of function you want. Look up an external database or an external system, whatever you like, uh, and then uh, that information will be then formatted into, into JSON, um, merged together with any other plugins you have, and then pass through the virtual machine. Um, so it's Keystone auth enabled, so uh, you can't just make a request to it to get data. Um, it actually has Keystone auth in front, and so uh, if your requests are legitimate requests through Nova the right way, Nova will pass that token authentication information through, um, so there is an element of security on that. Uh, the URL is there, if you want to have a look, check it out on GitHub, um, Apache license. Um, so this is just a little diagram to show you how it works. So you see, starting from the top here, uh, you've got your instance here on the left. Um, the first thing that happens is the instance will make the request over to get the vendor data to .json file. Uh, you can see it'll go through the Nova API, which will then um, pass that request along with the uh, context that we talked about earlier uh, through to the Nova Pollinate server. And then based on the plugins that you've built, uh, it'll make external calls to whatever system is appropriate. And then pass that request back through, uh, through Nova and then to, uh, to back to your instance. So the context provided by Nova, you've got project ID, instance ID, image ID, the user data, uh, the host name, and the uh, metadata. I've got user data in there twice, don't I? Hmm. Uh, and, and so with all this context, you can start to um, think about possibilities of what you might like to provide to your instance um, so having um, project ID, I find, is, is going to be a very useful one. So use cases. Um, so a simple use case might be that you have an instance that you boot, and that instance might want to, um, might want to start performing some API actions against your OpenStack API, but it might not, the instance actually itself won't know what project it's running under, because that's generally not available. 
So using this method, you could actually, um, you could use this to make that information available to your virtual machine. Um, so this case is provided in the source code, so you can go and have a look at it. And so what's going to happen is uh, when you, re when you re uh, request that vendor data to.json file from within your instance, um, it'll go through to Nova Pollinate. Nova Pollinate will query Keystone. Um, based on the context, it'll know what project it's come from. And so what the plugin does is it does an API request to Keystone, look up the project, give me the project information, and then pass all that through as, as, as JSON through to the instance. And so once you have that data, you can do whatever you like. So this use case, uh, Cloud Store is a, um, is a storage product by a company called Arnet um, that works in Australia. And they provide storage, um, free storage for researchers to use. Um, so we have a use case where we have a lot of users who might have storage through Cloud Store um, and want to use virtual machines on our cloud. Um, and so we wanted to facilitate a way that would make it super easy for them to use that storage. And so uh, we were working with Arnett to, um, to build a system where we could uh, send an API request to them to say, please provision us some storage. Um, they would provision the storage, send us back some credentials. Um, the storage is based on web dev, so they'd pass us a username and password. Um, and we would store that in Keystone um, for use in here. So what would happen is, uh, with this plugin, if the users had that storage, the plugin would go check Keystone, find those credentials, and if those credentials exist, then it would pass those credentials through, through the metadata. And then we would have a daemon, a small service that would run at boot time, and look for those credentials. And if it finds those credentials, then automatically create the mount point, um, add an entry to the FS tab, and mount that storage automatically for the user. So ultimately, the plan was that the user would be able to request the storage from an external service, and then have that whole process automated to the point where, when the instance boots, their storage would be mounted automatically, and they don't have to mess around with uh, fetching an external token or going onto the command line to um, uh, edit the FS tab to add the service, do any of that. We can automate that whole process. Um, so I think that was that's a very powerful thing to um, relieve relieve the users of that burden of having to do that, especially when the type of users we're dealing with are, are researchers who don't necessarily uh, understand command line very well, don't understand FS tabs and, and, and those sort of things. Um, and a third use case that we thought about is MATLAB. Um, and so because of the distributed nature of our cloud, we, uh, we service users from a lot of different institutions. And each of those institutions might have their own license server for MATLAB. And so by using this service, we could potentially um, create one Murano image or, or just a regular glance image that has MATLAB pre-configured for users to use, and, and then rely on something like dynamic vendor data to be able to, pro, um, to, to give us the correct license server information for that institution based on the user ID or the, the project ID. Uh, and so we could just store that in some external database or some other web service uh, and, and not have to burden the users on knowing um, which institution license server they need to connect to or um, require the different sites in our cloud to have to provide whole separate images that they build for MATLAB. And we can reduce all that duplication by having one image using dynamic vendor data with the Nova Pollinate service to then um, provide us with the correct license information at runtime and just make the whole process simpler for users. Um, so I think once you, once you start to think about what sort of things you can, um, what sort of things you can do for your users by providing dynamic vendor data, you can, th there's a lot of possibilities of ways that you can automate things and um, make it much simpler. Um, 
So the OpenStax docs page on vendor data um, is quite useful if you want to look into it more. Um, and uh, Michael still, I think, was the instigator of a lot of this uh, dynamic vendor data work that went into Nova. Um, so it's well worth looking at his uh, blog post for uh, some more context in how that works. Um, so that's it from me. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, if you're interested to uh, talk about dynamic vendor data or um, the Nova Pollinate service. Thanks very much.